GBT's net neural network has no recurrent connections. Each layer feeds into the next, but cannot feed any data back. So GPT is less like the back and forth be, uh, within the prefrontal lobes and uh, between the lobes and the language centers, and more like a Plinko game, where the signal just cascades unrepeating from the top to the bottom. Boink, ba doink, boink, boink, boink. And then whatever word it lands in is the one that it emits for its next sequence. Mm. So without loops, GPT cannot perform logic. Without the ability to loop back on itself, GPT cannot mentally backtrack a hypothetical answer. Mikhail Velocian, welcome back to Real Vision. It's always a pleasure to be here, Ash. Mikhail, I'm really excited for this conversation for two reasons. One, because I'm always excited when you join us. This topic, AI, your mastery of it is really interesting to me and I think to a lot of our Real Vision viewers and listeners. Really excited to talk about this. Number two, usually we run through this in detail before we do the show. I got a little bit of a sneak peek last night, but I have no idea what we're actually talking about today. Mikhail, what are we talking about? What's the topic? Well, I have no idea what I'm talking about most of the time either, Ash, but uh, I'll, I'll wing it as best I can, which is actually exactly what GPT does, as we will see over the course of this talk. We're going to be talking about how GPT handles logic and inference, uh, how it performs reasoning without thinking. Uh, to quote Star Wars Episode Two, if droids could actually think, there'd be none of us here, would there? <laughs> GPT cannot think, but it fakes it really well, and how it fakes it is what we'll be talking about here. We're going to start up the talk with a quick demonstration of a fact that usually shocks most people, which is that GPT can't do math. Uh, we're going to uh, have a very brief review of the principles of operation that I covered in, about GPT in the last talk. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on it. Uh, viewers should review talk number two. Um, but there are certain things that I'd like to remind them of. Um, we're going to talk about the contrast between uh, what people usually think of as AI and what GPT isn't. Um, and we're going to talk about some of the architectural principles that prevent GPT from actually doing real thinking or logic and then showing how GPT overcomes those limitations anyway um, and how you can engineer prompts that can maximize its uh, reasoning and logical inference potentials. Uh, I'll be doing demonstrations of navigation problems and a type of logic puzzle that uh, is particularly challenging to computers in general and GPT in particular, and showing how you can uh, how you can get it to solve it with your own, uh, you know, in your own exercises. First and foremost, the key takeaway that I want you guys to get is the GPT has no inner monologue. It can't think about answers, and any impression that you get that it's thinking or hesitating or pausing is just an illusion that arises by server load or network latency. Its thinking process is exactly what it emits as output. Um, the, uh, it's important to remember through all of these that GPT is a language model. It is not a database. It is not a reasoning engine. It is not a source of objective truth. Um, and in the long, uh, the long story short is that GPT is suitable for an interface layer on top of a database or logic engine, but it is not itself one. Mm. This, this video that I have here is, uh, I, I'd like to use this as a framing device for this talk. This is one of the first, uh, movies ever shown, uh, to a theater audience back in 1896 in, in Paris. There's a legend that when audiences saw that train rushing at them on the silver screen, they ran out of the theater screaming in terror. I don't believe that that legend is true. I think that was just a, a, an advertising gimmick. <laughs> but, the, um, uh, but the fact remains that we nowadays think of that story as really quaint. I believe that very soon, in the next several years, uh, the fact that people currently use GPT and other large language models, LLMs, for looking up data or performing reasoning will be seen as as quaint as we now see the notion of Parisian audiences in 1896 thinking that, that a projected train can actually run them over. I feel like there are people who would run out of the theater screaming if they could on AI right now. That's exactly the point. Um, and, and there are many who do. And that's why I really like that clip. 
um, because the way that we view those audiences now is how we'll be seen someday. Or some of us. Probably most of us, honestly. Um, so, first and foremost, let me show that GPT can't do math. Okay, so here I am on the GPT website, and uh, I'm going to ask it a very simple multiplication problem. Uh, single digits. And for single digits, it can easily handle it. Um, but if we go up to something like four digits at a time, times, let's say, then it'll give us an answer. But if we check that answer with a plain old calculator, uh, let's go just typing it into the browser right there, we can see that the answer is close. Uh, let's see, it's a uh, 59... 0.9 million. It's it's close, but uh, we can clearly see that uh, you know it got, it's starting by the hundreds digit. It started to take a little bit of liberty, didn't it? Now this is fascinating to me because generally speaking, I think in most of our experience, computers either get things right or wrong. The answer is never like, well, it's close. Right, and the um th this starts to get especially fun when you give it a set of simple problems. So instead of uh, four-digit numbers. Let's say it multiplies four two-digit numbers. Um, and once again, it'll give an answer that's just not right. If we simply ask it, we can see once again that the answer is about 10 million and change, but by the time it starts getting into the higher digits, it starts to you know, get a little sloppy. And uh, there's a number of things that we can do to help it along. Uh, and this becomes relevant with prompt engineering. So, we can ask it in English, and then say, uh, we, can help it, we can help the process along. Break up the numbers into pairs, and then multiply the products. Uh, so this exploits multiplication's commutative property, and so it'll talk through its work, and it'll come up with an answer that's possibly a little bit closer, but still wrong. This is like talking through math homework with your sixth grader. Exactly. Um, and it actually gets these two uh, parts right. It just fails to multiply them together correctly. And here's the actual answer of how to get GPT to do math. You start a new chat, and you use GPT-4, not 3, and you use this plugins architecture. Now... The plugins architecture is a system that OpenAI, the producers of GPT, created because they know that GPT is bad at a lot of things, especially, um, you know, analytical work. So they allowed third parties to build these sort of add-on applications, um, and they allow GPT to use these applications. Now, in practice, I think that this is actually a step towards... Uh, you know, sentience, if you will, rather than away from it, because what this means is that GPT is able to externalize its cognition. In other words, I believe that it's a fundamental property of self-awareness that you know what you're bad at and can accommodate your own cognitive shortcomings accordingly. Well, not everyone knows what they're bad at, but what's interesting to me about this is this idea that essentially you could have chat GPT being a kind of front end uh, and something like Wolfram Alpha, a very sophisticated computation engine on the back end where you can feed uh, the actual kind of complex mathematical stuff into. And what it starts to build uh, is something that has the ability, uh, you know, to kind of on a straight through basis actually handle things that look a lot like human cognition. Very much so. And in fact, uh, humans uh, shunt, their cog uh, shunt our own cognition to different areas of our brain as appropriate, right. almost by rote. There's a really famous technique uh, for memorization called the method of loci yeah. uh, that is... Uh, that's able to use your uh, parietal cortex and other spa your, uh, vi your visual spatial centers and other sort of spatial uh, capabilities that our primate, you know, tree-swinging brains are very, very good at um, in order to augment your uh, memory from about 7 to 12 units to upwards of 60 or even 100 or more. People who are practiced at the method of loci are really pretty stunning. Now, did we get the right answer from the plugin? Uh, yes, we did. Yeah, 704 is the hundreds, 021 in the thousands, and, and, and 10 million. So, yeah, uh, the plugin 
actually gives the right answer. But what this, chen what this tells us then is that the way you get GPT to do math is by telling GPT to not use GPT to do math. Right. So what exactly is going on here? G most people are, get really wigged out when they see this because they think GPT is a computer. <laughs> like, computers can do math. But the problem is that GPT isn't a computer. GPT is a program that's running on a computer. And uh, that program is a neural network language model, which at the end of the day is little more with a, than a spell checker with delusions of grandeur. <laughs> so expecting GPT to be able to do math is a little bit like expecting Excel to correct your grammar. Hey everyone, Browse French and Crypto, it's really my flagship show. It's where I interview the best guests in the world, people you never get on another show. I think it's the best show in macro, crypto, and Web3 combined. In fact, that's what it does, it covers everything. But really, it's all about the revolution in Web3 and crypto. And I'd love it if you got it every week in your inbox. All you have to do is just click on the link below, pop in your email address, and you'll get notified every time it comes out. And you don't miss anything as you take my journey into the exciting new world of crypto and Web3. Thanks. This is a good juncture, I think, to review a little bit of uh, what we covered in the last show. In the last show, and I'm going to go pretty quick. So, folks who want more details about this really should go back and visit part two. But the bottom line is that when you enter a sequence of text into GPT, it'll break that sequence up into tokens, which are basically word-like blocks. Uh, you can essentially think of tokens as words. It then turns the, converts those tokens into sequences of numbers sets those numbers as the activity levels for the first layer of a neural network, and then propagates those activity level levels through the neural network layer by layer. Each network, each neuron in each layer uh, both stimulates and inhibits certain neurons in the subsequent layers, uh, and so this activity propagation cascades down to the last layer. In the last layer, each neuron represents a potential output word, and it's got either high or low stimulation levels. Uh, the GPT program then cancels out all but the highest uh, neuron stimulation levels and takes the corresponding words and picks randomly uh, based on what their activity levels are. And then it does two things. One is that it emits the word that it's chosen back to your user interface. The other thing that's super important is that it takes that word and feeds it back into its own input. So it takes your original prompt plus its own output and feeds that as its own input into the next word, uh, so to produce the next word, that is. This is a process called autoregression, and it's how GPT builds an output sequence for itself and for you, one word at a time. So, given that that's what GPT does and how it's built. I'd like to talk about the differences between conventional AI, what's occasionally called GoFi or GoFe, good old fashioned AI, versus GPT. We use AI ubiquitously in the modern world. Um, those of us who are gamers uh, experience AI with our video game enemies, and uh, the con and even if you aren't gamers, most people are probably aware nowadays of the fact that. Uh, that, that AI can beat grandmasters of the world uh, in games like chess or Go. We use uh, AI every day for navigation. Uh, you know, Google Maps works with, you know, all of us use Google Maps at one point or another. Uh, AI is used in manufacturing and in business applications. Um, and in all of these cases, the nature of the AI is always logical, methodical, precise, rigorous. Um, and in movies and fiction, uh, AGI, you know, the Holy Grail, uh, artificial general intelligence, the sentient AIs that are featured by, you know, as like Skynet or HAL 9000, these are all dis depicted as descendants of the type of AI that we're more familiar with, this sort of rigorous, logical uh, system. Neural networks and large language models, uh, well, large language models based on neural networks, are not like this at all. They are opportunistic, lazy, and they're driven by immediate gratification. Just like human beings. Exactly. <laughs> um, they're, um, they're driven by, um, uh, they're not driven by logic. 
and if you ask them to provide logical justification for their actions, they provide uh, what's called deontological or causative explanations. In other words, why did you do this thing? Like, why did you turn left? Well, because the muscles of my left hand turned my steering wheel. No, I want, uh, that's not a satisfying answer. We want to know the purpose that you were going for. That's called a teleological explanation, and neural networks cannot do that. They can pretend to, but their, their uh, emission of teleological explanations is itself still causative. I'll explain in a minute. Probably where AI is at its most AI-iest is when it's playing strategy games. And this is where sort of this cold calculating Skynet AI uh, is usually associated with. Um, the Minimax algorithm uh, predates even the existence of computers themselves. And the Minimax algorithm is a very simple concept. If you have a strategy game, uh, you look at the board and you look at all of your possible moves on this board. You look at all of your opponent's possible moves. You look at all of your possible counter-counter moves to your opponent's counter moves, and so on, just blowing up the, uh, the search tree of, of movement space until you get to end game states. And then you choose movements that will take you to victory and that prevent your opponent from reaching victory. It's fairly simple in concept, but in execution in the real world, it's complicated by the fact that this combinatorical explosion is enormous. For the game of tic-tac-toe itself, there's over 360,000 possible ways that the game can play out. The computer pioneer Claude Shannon, uh, himself a remarkable man, um, he computed something called the Shannon number for chess. Uh, the Shannon number lists the total number of possible games of chess, and there are more possible games of chess than there are atoms in the entire observable universe. So, the, uh, uh, like, the... the possibility of enumerating every single possible move right from the opening board is just a non-starter. So in practice, what real AIs do is they perform what's called heuristic pruning, which is that they assess, they make a snap judgment of a position on the board, and they think, uh, this is already seen as a bad position, and I'm not going to explore this, uh, this option further. In the game of chess, the way this plays out is if you're, if you're exploring a move sequence and you're already down by a queen and two rooks, there's no reason to continue searching those possibilities. Uh, you're not going to eke out a win out of your shiny metal ass. Uh, it's just not going to happen. I have days where I feel like I'm down two queens and a rook, or two rooks and a queen. I'm... <laughs> uh, there are days that I, feel down, that I feel like I'm down two queens and a rook. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, both. So it's less thorough, but it makes it possible to run these games on CPUs. There's this really cool thing that's been being done in the last 15 years or so. The, the AIs that beat Garry Kasparov at chess and the Grandmaster at Go and stuff like that, they use neural networks to perform instantaneous board assessments. So they actually integrate neural networks into their heuristic processing. So these are hybrid architectures, and I think that that's really pretty awesome. The, this AI approach, this sort of GoFay approach, is most easily visualized with navigation. Um, the, uh, so navigation nowadays, even with stuff like Google Maps, is done with slight variations of a breadth-first search, which basically means you start down a path, and then every, every branch that that path takes, you explore all of those branches, you explore all of the branches of those branches, and so on. Once a branch reaches the goal, you then backtrace all the way up to your starting point, and, uh, and then you emit to the user what that final result is. So what that means is that just like in, uh, just like in the previous uh, example of chess or go or tic-tac-toe, the, the computer already knows how the entire game is going to play out before it even makes its first move. Likewise, Google, Ma Google Maps knows how your entire route is going to go from your home to your destination before it's even told you to pull out of the driveway. The entire thing is already planned. This is in stark... I show this because it's very different from, uh, let's say, other approaches. It is possible to perform, a, to perform a navigation with absolutely no plan and with no history of where you came from and no clear concept of where you're going. 
uh, we generally refer to this class of algorithms as greedy algorithms, and they very, they're basically algorithms that live, quote-unquote, in the moment. They look at your current situation, look at your current action options, and pick the one that looks best right now. Uh, they retain no internal state. They're very, very fast at uh, performing immediate execution, but they have no guarantee of reaching your goal in any reasonable time or even ever. The algorithm that I'm showing you right now is uh, a greedy-ish maze runner with random back off and retry. Basically, it goes down a hallway. When it hits a dead end, it backs up and uh, turns a random direction and tries again. This will get you to the result eventually. You certainly don't want to navigate uh, to your local grocery store this way, but it's good enough for houseflies, hamsters, and Roombas. Um, and when it comes to, you know, just taking an action that seems best at the time, it's good enough for crypto traders that have not done it, their due diligence. It's certainly good enough for socially awkward AI presenters that need to spontaneously come up with the next thing that's going to come out of their mouths. Ooh, that's tough. Artificial stupidity. Ain't it, though? Uh, so the long story short is that you use traditional good old-fashioned AI when the programmer can define a rigorous symbolic representation of the AI's world when we already know the moves or transforms that apply to that world, uh, when we can define the criteria that define desirable and undesirable states, and when we can code heuristics that guide the AI towards uh, de desirable states and away from undesirable ones. And you use a neural network when you can't be arsed to do any of that. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a famous quote, a neural network is the second best way to solve any problem. The best way is to actually understand the problem. <laughs> but this, this speaks to the points that you were making earlier about this perception of thought where no thought is actually taking place. Yeah, yeah. The nuances of the English language, the structure of every idiom, the uh, like, the exact ways that we conjugate all of our verbs and uh, the way that we make tenses match is a very, very large set of rules. I extraordinarily large. And large language models use neural networks because... That's a lot of stuff to, to hard code. And um, many, many attempts have been made in the last several decades to try to get realistic sounding language that, uh, you know, through the good old fashioned approach. And frankly, it's just more feasible to just let a computer figure it out with a neural network and a buttload of, sort of, of training data. So the way that, ne that this neural network works is by spitting out words at a constant rate. GBD produces one token at a time. Every trip through the neural network is a constant time operation. The entire prompt is presented as a single tensor, which means that long prompts take exactly as many computations to produce the next word as a short prompt. So if you give it the entire, you know, opening paragraph of some novel and you, expect, and you ask it to produce the next word of the novel, it's going to take exactly as much computation to produce that next word as Mary had a little blank. Now, that's counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of people who are get, coming to understand that. What's the reason behind that? You might be aware of the fact that GPT has a fixed buffer of, uh, of input-output size. So both your input and your output have to be less than 4,000 words, right? Or 16,000 if you're using GPT-3.5 Turbo with 16, uh, in 16 mode. Um, what it's doing is it's taking a 16,000-word block and zeroing out all of the words, and then unzeroing the words that actually correspond to your input. So um, it's receive when you're giving it a short input, it's still receiving all sixteen that entire sixteen thousand word block. It's just that most of the contents in it are zero. Complicated words take as much computation to produce as simple ones. Uh, so teleological takes as much computational power to produce as the. <laughs> and complicated concepts take exactly as much computational power to produce to talk about as simple ones. So quantum superposition takes as much power to talk about as Phoenix. So the reason why this is all a single blast is shown by contrast when you think about how humans uh, process conversation. When we converse, we get an auditory stimulus from our ears, which then goes into our language centers and gets decoded into thoughts and ideas that then propagate to our prefrontal lobes. 
in our prefrontal lobes, they bounce around and integrate with uh, our pre-existing knowledge and, con and uh, whatever concepts and ideas might already exist in our heads. And there's this back and forth process of the new ideas represented by the words and the existing ideas uh, in our knowledge base. Um, once we're ready to respond, we send a signal back to our language centers, and then there's additional back and forth where our, lang where our language centers come up with a sequence of words, and our prefrontal lobes evaluate those words to determine whether or not they really properly express the idea that we want to say. Uh, once we determine that this is that this sequence of words is in fact what we want to say. Uh, we then send the signal down to our motor cortex and brain and uh, spinal cord, where it emits uh, a mu a set of uh, muscular movements through our mouth and jaw and whatnot, and then we actually utter. It's worth noting that this is not how GPT works, and not just because it has no mouth and must scream. Um, GPT's ne neural network has no recurrent connections. Each layer feeds into the next, but cannot feed any data back. So GPT is less like the back and forth be, uh, within the prefrontal lobes and uh, between the lobes and the language centers, and more like a Plinko game, where the signal just cascades, unrepeating, from the top to the bottom. Boink, ba doink, boink, boink, boink. And then whatever word it lands in is the one that it emits for its next sequence. Mm. So without loops, GPT cannot perform logic. Without the ability to loop back on itself, GPT cannot mentally backtrack a hypothetical answer. It can't potentially eval it can't evaluate a potential output and then uh, and and then choose a different one. Without the ability to mentally backtrack, GPT cannot solve multi-step logic problems. It emits each word impulsively because that seems like the best word at the time, and when it emits a word, it cannot unemit it. So except in the very rare cases where it happens to, the very first thing it says happens to be the right answer, it cannot perform logic. So Mikhail, is this something that is an inherent property of the system that can't be modified, or could we see a future model of ChatGPT where the ability to loop and to sort of continue to analyze what's already been spoken, or what's about to be spoken and modified, is that something that's potential, or is it an inherent constraint of the technology? There are ways to get GPT to have multiple output streams, one to itself and one to the user. Um, and when you split out GPT that way, uh, there, you, you do in fact get the experience where the user asks a question, watches GPT sit there for a little while, and then GPT comes out with a more thought out answer. A subset of that is something that we already saw with the calculator, where the calcul where GPT showed a little icon that said "solving using calculator," and then it finally came up with an, with a response. Now, this is th these architectures are built on top of GPT. They're not a replacement of GPT or a change to GPT itself, um, and I should say GPT and other LLMs. Um, but this is very nascent emergent technology, um, and we're going to see more of it as, we, you know, as time goes on. There is an elephant in the room, which is that I said that GPT can't perform logic, but obviously it absolutely can. We've seen it. And the, even, like, even in a single run, even in a single run through, and as a demonstration, uh, I'm going to show that GPT is actually perfectly fine at doing the very thing that I said it cannot do, which is navigate a somewhat complex topology. This is the floor plan of a real architect. Uh, I like didn't ask his permission, so I hope that's okay. Um, but I hope he doesn't mind, uh, you know, randwolf.com. Credit where it's due. Um, the, uh, what we can do is specify this... Uh, floor plan to GPT. We can specify it uh, by, the easiest way to do it is we went through it by hand and noted every doorway and said what, what uh, rooms are connected by these doorways. And then we said to GPT, find a route from the master bedroom to the garage. And uh, I've got this in my history right here. So we can see that, um, you know, I had it enumerate, and what it does is uh, I tell it, find a route from the master bedroom to the garage, and it says you go in this following sequence of, uh, of moves. 
this is exactly the correct answer. It just, it, like, it doesn't make a single wrong turn. And the thing is, it's perfectly, it had many opportunities to make wrong turns. Um, in every room that it passed through, there was at least one doorway that goes the wrong way. It didn't take any of those incorrect options, which means that this cannot be blind luck. GPT must actually know how to traverse the graph. So how is it doing that? An intuitive answer, which is wrong, by the way, <laughs> is that every layer represents uh, a position in the house. And every layer tells the next layer the next room to go into in the house. And uh, that layer tells the, the layer after that, another room, and so on. If any rooms are dead ends, then they signal back up to the previous layer, I can't go here. And then that, layer, uh, that previous layer uh, corrects its next assumption and tells the layer below it, okay, now try this other room. That's the so-called looping that you said GPT does not do. Exactly. It can't do that because it cannot signal from one layer up previous to the layer before it. Right. So uh, what it does instead is something kind of interesting. Uh, the only thing that it cares about is what do I say next? Uh, remember that it is not interested in finding a, com a complete route at the start. It only cares about what's the next thing to say. And so... In, uh, in fairly early layers, uh, neurons start forming voting blocks, so to speak, uh, about what is the most appropriate answer to give. Uh, in a transformer neural network, T in GPT stands for transformer, which is a wiring pattern for neural networks. Um, and in a transformer, uh, neurons are arranged into groups that are called attention blocks. Each attention block uh, represents a... It's complicated, but for our purposes, an attention block represents the next a, a candidate for the next thing to say. And as the layers go down, the attention blocks draw from the source material, uh, in other words, the initial request and the description of the house, to increase or decrease their activation levels. So you can think of this as increasing or decreasing uh, the, the votes in a runoff voting process. So in this example, garage might lose activation because there are no passages from garage to master bedroom. Uh, same thing for the entryway. Long haul gains activation levels because it is connected to the master bedroom and it has other, and because it's not a dead end. Bathroom is the same way. It also is connected to the master bedroom and also isn't a dead end. But in subsequent layers, everything that's connected to bathroom is a dead end, so bathroom loses votes. By the end of the process, uh, long haul is not so much the answer as it is the winning candidate for the next thing to say. And so once GPT has said long haul and emitted it, it is now committed to it. And so the next answer that it gives is, uh, is going to be based on the fact that it previously said long haul. And so that's how it builds this response, this correct response, sorry, uh, piecemeal, step by step, even though this is not a problem that can really be solved in a piecemeal manner. Fascinating. Because it builds this uh, output in this sort of local runoff manner, um, it's inherently constrained by the number of layers that it has to uh, available for its processing capabilities. Now, GPT-4 has hundreds of layers. But even so, a lot of those layers are required for really basic things like understanding the words and formulating a response. In much the same way as, you know, we have, a, we have a big brain, but a lot of our brain is devoted to basic things like breathing and, like, you know, moving our arms and gesticulating and stuff, right? So I have a, uh, I have a demonstration of how you can get GPT lost in a freaking hallway. Um, and the, um, and this demonstration will show a really important principle of prompt engineering, uh, that hopefully will be a, a good takeaway for, uh, for audiences. What I've built is a, um, is a, is a, is a house that consists of 20 rooms that are literally numbered start and then room one, room two, or I guess start room two, room three, room four, room five, room 20 to finish. So the house is literally a, like, a, you know, it's a, it's a railroad apartment, right? A very, very, very long railroad apartment. 
Um, and then what I do is uh, I give this floor plan, but I don't give it sequentially. Um, I say room 13 is connected to room 14, room 17 to room 18. I give it out of order. And the reason I do that is so that GPT can't just read down the sequence and see that the house is nothing but a glorified hallway. I then ask not a path question, but a comprehensive question. Uh, I, can you navigate from room start to room finish? Um, and let me do this in GPT because what happens is really interesting. So uh, let me get my prompt over here. So what I'm doing here is giving GPT this floor plan with the rooms, with, with the connections out of order, but they still just describe a linear house. I then tell it to give me a comprehensive answer. Can I reach room finish from room start? And I don't want it to explain it, its answer. I just want it to tell me yes or no. And it correctly answers yes. But watch this. I can then start breaking pieces of the chain. Now remember, this is a linear house, so breaking any part of it is going to result in an answer of no, logically, right? But if you, it's, but as you can see, it still answers yes. Um, I can break substantial portions of the chain. Here, let me uh, let me delete uh, a couple of these uh, of these doorways. Boom, and. Uh, it's going to think for a second, and it's still, I mean, not really. It's just sending to the server. So, so why is it telling you? Essentially, if you're breaking these links in the chain, uh, you should not be able to go from start to finish. So why does ChatGPT think that you can? Because it's not actually plotting the house. It's not actually uh, determining a sequence of rooms. In fact, if you ask it, uh, watch this. If you ask it uh, to tell you, like, how are you doing that, um, then here's what happens. So I'm going to tell it, uh, you know, show, show the sequence of rooms that you pass through to get from start to finish. And so it's going to say, sure, and at some point, it's going to say, like, I'm going to ask it, like, are there doorways between each of these rooms? Yeah. So now it realizes. <laughs> yeah. And so it, then when you ask it, uh, it realizes that, upon uh, that like there actually doesn't exist a sequence so the reason why it's saying yes is because it wasn't given the opportunity to actually determine whether or not there is a sequence so it's just giving the best first response that it can give without actually thinking about the problem um the right answer then is to uh one moment the right answer then is to first uh tell it um uh, the following. Uh, here's how you here's how you phrase this. Can I reach uh, room start to room finish? Inst instead of saying don't show your work and don't list the sequence, I say first show your work and list the sequence, making sure that there are in fact doorways at each step then answer yes or no. And when you do that, it talks for a while. Boom, ba boom, ba boom. And it notices that, uh, and then it starts to backtrack right in front of you. And now it's doing exactly the thing that we describe navigation algorithms do. It's trying a path, finds a dead end, trying another path, finding a dead end. In this case, it actually tried the same bat and tries the same path multiple times because after all, uh, it's, uh, it's a hallway. So it's basically acting like a Roomba that's stuck. <laughs> and, 
it, I, you know, it might actually eventually answer no. We'll see. But while it's, uh, while it's figuring it's okay. And now, after a lot of thought and the actual performing of the exact algorithm that we asked, that, that I earlier said that it can't do, it actually produces the correct answer of no. So what's going on? Um, this works because GPT is autoregressive. It feeds its own output back into itself to serve as its own input for the next word. The input then builds with both your original question and also everything that GPT has said so far, which means that its output serves both as an answer to you and also as a working scratch pad or memo pad for itself. GPT has no internal loops, but the entire architecture is built as one giant external loop. The point is that in order to get GPT to solve logic problems, GPT needs to hear itself think. It needs to be able to talk through the problem out loud. And uh, honestly, humans often use this approach for hard problems too. Like you might have thought at the very beginning of this presentation, when you're multiplying two, uh, like a sequence of two digit numbers, it actually helps to say like, okay, 18 times 72, 18 times 72. Okay, well, if I've got the 18 and first I multiply the two, like it actually helps to hear yourself say it um, and to have the output of your, of your mouth actually echo in your own ears. Well, GPT, ha for GPT, this is the only way that it can hear itself think. It has to output to you as well as outputting to itself. And that's why uh, the, uh, this prompt engineering pro tip is to ask GPT to first show its work and then check it and then produce a final, uh, final yes or no or single value answer. Kel, this is really incredible stuff. I see why you were so excited about this presentation, why you wanted to surprise me with it. You did not disappoint. I was blown away. It's fascinating to me to actually understand a little bit about the way chat GPT and other large language models work. So for people who are kind of just reeling, taking all of this in, getting their heads around what this technology is about, what do you think some of the key takeaways are that you'd like to leave them with in terms of the way this technology works and what its impact is going to be on their lives in the future? There's a couple of key takeaways. First of all, there's a lot of folks out there in the audience right now that want to use GPT for uh, problem solving and for various uh, business related or possibly even personal life related applications. And what the key thing that I want them to understand uh, is how to perform this whole first show, then check, then answer process, because it's super important to do that when working with this technology in its current form. Uh, you know, you're gonna, if you're using this to enhance your own life or to get, or to make your own business better, then like, hopefully this talk will help you understand how to use these tools properly. Um, these tools don't help you, uh, the, these tools are not self-documenting. GPT will happily answer a question incorrectly if you present it in a manner that does not allow GPT to explain itself, as, as we've already seen many times during this talk. And this is the importance of prompt engineering, obviously, and the way that you frame a question, and I think you showed us a bit of that, which is really interesting. Exactly. And I just, um, if this helps people use this new tool better, then that's a big gain that I think, uh, you know, that, that's, that, that, you know, that's a benefit that we can place out upon the world. Um, the, uh, for folks that aren't directly using GPT, but are interested in how this will impact them down the road, uh, this is hopefully illustrating the fact that, uh, there is such a thing as traditional, you know, good old fashioned AI. And I hope that this, and, and the GPT isn't it. I hope that this helps people understand the gap between what they imagine as Skynet or, you know, uh, you know, or, or the computer from war games versus what GPT is currently capable of. And more importantly, the gap between existing hard AI technologies, so to speak, and neural networks. Now, um, Will these two, you know, do these two interoperate? Of course. We see them interoperate with game players. As I mentioned uh, midway through the talk, there are ways that you can get, uh, like, uh, get neural nets to be, uh, to augment traditional AIs, such as we see in chess players or 
uh, players of the, you know, automated players of the game StarCraft uh, or other strategy games. So we're going to see more of this going on. And right now, what we're seeing is a breakthrough in neural ne in uh, language processing using neural network technologies. And going forward, we will see these being merged with these more traditional AI approaches. But if, the, but if this talk helps you understand anything, it's that these are still separate AI paradigms and research to merge them together into something that resembles more of a general intelligence is still ongoing. Well, Mikhail, that seems like a great place to leave it. I can speak for myself, certainly. I definitely benefited from this. I think this is just incredible. We're going to have to have you back soon to do part four. I don't know, maybe part 40. Uh, this is a rabbit hole that I've gone down, and I'm sure a lot of our viewers and listeners have as well. Really fascinating to have someone who's working from the inside of this field actually walk us through the way this works. This is content. This is information that most people are simply just not getting anywhere else. A great pleasure to have you with us, as always, Mikhail. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a, it's a delight and an honor, Ash, and I look forward to next time. Thanks for watching, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that one as much as I did. Have a great day. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.